Okay, well, we're here today with uh, Charles Johns. He was a, in the U.S. Marine Corps during World War II. He flew in a uh, night fighter squadron, squadron um, 534. He attained the rank of captain, and he served um, at Espiritu Santos, Kwajalein, and was part of Task Force 58. So um, I'd just like to start the interview and ask you, uh, how did you get involved in the military, or you know, where did you hear, hear about Pearl Harbor? You know, what were you doing when you heard about that? Well, I was working in a bank in New York and uh, going to uh, taking college courses at night when this all broke loose. My father was with Otis Elevator and he got transferred to Washington to be a uh, liaison with the Navy Department. So I helped them move down and from there I uh, applied for the Naval Flight uh, Program and was accepted. But it was quite a while before we did anything. Because in the meantime, they sent uh, me to Roanoke College uh, for three or four months, and then to uh, pre-flight school at University of Georgia for another three months before we uh, got to fly. I mean, went up to uh, what the what the Navy calls E base, which is elimination base, and flew Stearmans up the. Uh, at uh, Anacostia, D.C., and if you got through that, then you were trained. Then we got to Pensacola. That was a real boost. We flew uh, Volte fixed landing gear trains for the basic, and then moved into the SNJ, which we uh, trained in extensively. And there was always. Uh, physical fitness courses and uh, academics all the way through refresher courses. So it was uh, after we finished everything, oh, then they, well, oh, they, I went to a, a fighter school. They broke it down into a dive bomber school at Pensacola, bombers, and uh, I went to, into fighters. And then we went, I went to advanced fighter school. And then I fully expected to be assigned to a, a, a fighter squadron and fly Corsairs. But the Marine Corps had just started a new program of night fighters, and that's where I got assigned. How did you get, how, how did you uh, get assigned to a night fighter squadron? What criteria did they use was there anything about your abilities that they thought, hey, this guy's going to be great for that? Well, it, a matter of fact, it was a colonel, a land-based colonel, sitting in a desk, and we would go up and get our assignment. And I said to him, sir, I really am supposed to go to day fighters, and uh, there's a Captain Blackbird, and we were going to join, and he said, night fighters. <laughs> so that's how I got assigned. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And then we went to uh, Cherry Point, North Carolina, and trained extensively on flying it and SPD dive bombers and. Uh, that was the Dauntless, is that right? Yeah, dive bombers, just for uh, to practice this radar, which was developed by Sperry Hutchinson, Sperry Brand, Sperry Rand, and then finally. The Hellcats arrived, and we got to fly them, which was a great plane. And we uh, trained then, and trained and trained, and uh, finally flew the squadron out to uh, San Diego. Sat around there for three weeks, and then finally got loaded on a carrier, the Breton, which was a small CV, and went to Espirito Santos to, in the New Hebrides and did more of that type flying, checking radar on each other. And, and uh, then we got on the, another carrier, the Santee, and sailed up through Kwajalein and, and Weetalk Edgeby. And we left in a Weetalk at night, and uh, I was sitting on the flight deck thinking, God, we're in the middle of its dark Pacific with one little destroyer escort and uh, with us, and it's kind of hairy. Then 
we, uh, in the morning I woke up and went up and looked. We were in the midst of a jillion Navy ships. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and from there we sailed on up to the Marianas. We were catapulted into, uh, into Guam, landed on a coral strip in Ghana, and we lived in uh, tents for a Pup tents for a while, then we got follies built. In the, with a, it's a tent, but it's supported by two by fours. And we flew night air combat patrols there and uh, attacked Rota, a Japanese held island between Saipan and Guam. At night, the day fighters would go up and wherever, from wherever they got shot at. And if any activity, they'd come back and report it to the intelligence officer. We'd get that information and go up and uh, strafe and try to drop. We could carry two bombs, try to hit that. What, what did a night fighter do that was different from a day fighter other than flying at night? Was there anything, um, was there any responsibilities you had that were different? Well, they were different as much as uh, I never, we never used our fighter skills because it was all, we were vectored by a, uh, a ground radar controller mm -hmm. and he'd get a blip on his screen coming in and get the altitude of the heading and then he'd bring us in, be uh, in behind him so we were within four miles of him. Then we could pick him up on this little radar scope of ours, which was uh, Point to think it had two dots. One was the target. One was you, and uh, you had to keep them in the middle of this thing till it would drop down. But as I say, we uh, our biggest targets, well, on uh, Guam and Saipan, were uh, B-29s coming back from Japan and uh, had not activated their IFF identification friend or foe, so that appeared as an unknown. And they put us at the back of them, and we'd have to uh, identify them. And it, the danger was that uh, they were tired and sleepy, and uh, we had flame arresters on our plane. But if you got it going in too quickly and throttle back, it'd send out sparks. <laughs> and it, we were always afraid a tail gunner was going to wake up and, and start shooting at us, but it never happened. These sparks coming out, yeah. they're, they're, they're shooting yeah. at them, huh? <laughs> yeah. And then we uh, finally, uh, after no attacks on Guam, five of us went up to Saipan and uh, did much the same thing. Then we came back to the States to get uh, a new a fighter plane, the F-7F Wildcat, which was a twin engine, and also you had a radar operator with you. We never had anything like that. And while before we before we really got into that, they dropped the bomb, and so we stayed at the Cherry Point. I'm going to tell them, Mary about the Navy nurses coming. <laughs> we had uh, two. You Navy nurse, uh, nurses come in to our base, and they had to walk. But Not Cherry Point, though. No, down at Eagle Mountain Lake, Texas. Lake. They had to walk through the, the officer's called bar into the dining room, and these two young, prim, white, uniformed girls came walking through, and not to be too impolite, I... Uh, <laughs> Watched her through the bottom of a cocktail glass, <laughs> <laughs> and I figured if she looks this good through the bottom of a blurry glass, that's for me. <laughs> and so we did get together and uh, have been for the last 60 years. So wow. that's probably the most important uh, achievement of my <laughs> service career. <laughs> then I was uh, released after Mary was, we took the, took the squadron back to Cherry Point and got orders to inactive duty from there. Flew out to, to Iowa to meet Mary's folks and then uh, flew to New Jersey for Mary to meet folks. my folks and uh, 
Then we didn't see much of each other until, uh, we didn't see anything of each other until August when we got married. Mm -hmm. No kidding. How many, um, how many missions did you end up flying? Sir? Sure. Did you, did you keep track of the number of missions that you flew? Oh gosh, no, we were up every night. Really? And uh, about every third night it would be our turn to hit the uh, rota. Mm -hmm. The guys with really courage were, uh, if somebody parachuted or got shot down over rota, every night there was a different escape beach, and they, which they got briefed on, and they were supposed to get to that beach. Then the Navy would go up with a, a destroyer, a little destroyer escort, and guys would get in a rubber boat and go and wait around on that beach. And our mission was to strafe behind it and hope that the guy was on the beach and not weren't coming through the trees. But I thought we never heard of anyone getting out of that. But I, we always thought, boy, I hope I'm not strafing the poor guy when he's wow. <laughs> coming through the trees. We had one pilot. As a matter of fact, our executive officer was up on a bad night, and uh, he wasn't receiving the, the transmissions. And we were receiving him, but uh, he couldn't. He couldn't hear, and he was asking for a heading and everything. And of course, they couldn't give it to him. He said, "Oh, never mind. I see your uh, landing lights, and we didn't have any on, <laughs> and it was Rhoda." Oh wow! So he landed on Rhoda. And uh, we never heard any more from him either, so. So, I mean, um, was that, I hadn't heard of Rota before, Is that was that actually a very important Japanese-held island? Yeah, well, it was. The submarines came in there and they uh, refueled. A uh, fellow in our squadron shot one plane down that was coming into Rota from uh, Japan, and it... Uh, they picked him up with a radar from uh, captains, the admiral's ship, and then they transmitted that to a destroyer on the screen, and then he vectored the pilot in, and he shot him down. Wow! So it was—I uh, don't know how important a part, but it was a refueling and uh, information point for the Japanese. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, about my career, isn't it, honey? <laughs> <laughs> well, I have some questions I'd oh, like to ask okay. if you don't mind. Um, you know, you said you flew the Dauntless in training, and then you went, moved on to the Hellcat eventually. Can you describe the characteristics between flying those two planes? Like, what was the difference in flying the Dauntless versus the Hellcat? Oh, uh, uh, the Hellcat was a very easy plane to fly, but it was 2,000 horsepower. Uh, as opposed to a thousand thirteen hundred, which we had been flying, uh, it was a terrific airplane, handled beautifully, and uh, was much easier plane to handle than the Corsair because the the Corsair had such a long nose out in front of you that uh, you really had to be going on the sides to see anything. So coming in for a landing, you. We're hoping that you were lined up correctly, mm -hmm. but that was a that was a great plane. But it looked much prettier in the air than on the ground. We inverted gull wing, and that's because it had such a big prop and kept it prop and hit the ground. Mm -hmm. But I liked the uh, Hellcat; was a fun airplane. Um, how, when you flew the Dauntless bombers? What was the main differences between that and the Hellcat? Oh, just speed. And uh, one time I tried to dive, which, it, which is, was fun, with the diving flaps. Yeah. But it was strictly a training vehicle for us. Good. At that point in the war, the Dauntless had been kind of retired. Is that correct, from, from combat? Well, not really. They were still using them on the, in the fleet. They used them in Midway, and they used them all the way through, I think. I don't okay. know that they re ever replaced them with a, with a new one. They had Grumman made a torpedo bomber, and uh, as a matter of fact, Grumman was building the, a torpedo bomber. 
Was the Helldiver brought in as a replacement for the Dauntless at one point, or? No, it was brought in to replace the Wildcat, the F4F, oh, okay. which was underpowered when it came to zero. Mm -hmm. The zero could outclimb it, and help the you know, Wildcat would try to to uh, get it, but he'd fall out, and the Japanese just came down and it was right on his tail. So the uh, the Hellcat could stay with it and could dive dive faster and uh, fly higher and just outclass the, and also had armor plating, which uh, the Zeros did not have. Did you ever um, encounter a Zero? No. No? On the ground. On the ground. We destroyed some on the ground, <laughs> which, was, which wasn't our mission, but at least it made us feel better. <laughs> Um, had you ever seen or did you have gun camera footage that was being taken whenever you do your strafing and stuff like that? Was there any gun camera footage? Oh yeah, that was all on gun. Every time you fired, uh, it, it activated the camera. Were you able, ever able to, to see any of that? No, they never they no. never got briefed. Like they show in the movies, everybody watches it. But I guess maybe if we were still in a carrier, the ready room, they would do that. They would show that, but we didn't have any facilities mm -hmm. to do that. Our biggest facility was a old club we built out of a big tent. It was lined with parachute colored cargo chutes with runway lights behind it. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, stuff we stole from the CBs to build it. <laughs> what was the uh, the armament that the Hellcat had? It had 650 caliber machine guns and could carry uh, eight rockets. And later they added a uh, 20 millimeter cannon, which shot through the hub. But we never, I didn't get it. That was after I came home. How accurate were the rockets when you'd fire rockets back then? Oh, they were pretty good. They uh, they were. Everything was relative. I mean, you're flying 300 miles an hour, and you let them go. And you hope that they could not didn't overshoot it. Same with our bombs. And the how would you uh, how would you aim the rockets? Did you have to fire first, and then to get an idea if you were lined up, and then shoot your rockets? Or yeah, well then, I mean that was it. You had one. You lined up, and boom, they were gone. You could shoot them individually or all at once. So your rockets were were set up to to be fired at the same direction that your guns were yeah, firing at. Right. Okay. And then they exploded. You know when they hit where we had uh, an armor plating uh, uh, penetrating. We had a tracer, armor piercing, and a regular in that sequence in our guns. Mm -hmm. We had gun. Uh, Pockets in the wings, gun boxes, mm -hmm. and all in all, I have to say I enjoyed my military career. Uh huh. I bet it was. I bet it was exhilarating at times. Yeah. You know, flying those those big planes at nineteen years old, you know. Oh and yeah. Well, after we got out, when when Korea started, we had two children. And I was getting a letter almost daily from, like I still remember his name, General Silverthorne, that we were on 48-hour notice, no excuses, that we go back. And they got to the class, I was in class 4B at Pensacola, and that's the way they were calling them. And they called 4A, but that was the end of the involuntary uh, call back. The uh, going back to those rockets real quick. Um, I've always been kind of fascinated that you know they first started using rockets pretty much during that war. What sort of explosive was on the rockets? What how powerful were those when they exploded? I can't tell you. It, it, it made a big. What what would you what sort of targets would you use them against? Oh, against uh, uh, caves. I mean, where people said there were caves, and against things like that. Anything that uh, you thought you could hit and blow up. Mm -hmm. The destroyers going around the northern end of Guam would pull in close to the shore, and they had a battery of rockets going. Wow! It, uh, and that's where I first 
found out that a battleship's 16-inch gun and projectile comes out red hot. <laughs> we we watched that from where we were uh, when we first got to Guam. We, we uh, they were still bombarding the northern end of it, and the uh, boy it would, it would go with a tremendous boom, and the sound reached just the ground would shake. But that was. Uh, and you could see the shell was red yeah, hot. Yeah. Was this because you were flying at night? You could see yeah, it at night, night of course. Uh -huh. Wow. Um, you know, one of the things I always wondered about the night fighters, um, how are you able to keep from getting disoriented when you're flying over the Pacific and it's dark oh. at night and you're in dark water? It was all instruments on a, on a real uh, dark night, but bright stars, they were reflecting in the ocean and you really had to work at watching your instruments to know whether you were looking at the sky or the sea. Mm -hmm. It was well, it was all instruments. You really had to trust them because uh, it was easy to get vertigo I bet. and think you were diving when you're actually climbing. Well, our instrumentation with, with the gyro horizon and whatnot was was fatigue ever a problem for you on some of your missions? How, was fatigue ever a problem for you? Were you ever on long missions where you became very tired and disoriented? No, we were up uh, two and a half hours at a time okay. at night, and I never really got uh, got badly shaken up by uh, because I trust that we had a lot of instrument training, mm -hmm. and it was just uh, natural to fly by. Once you got over the ocean, the, with no visual contact with anything, it mm -hmm. was uh, you really needed to fly by instruments. Mm -hmm. So, did you land? So you landed. You were mostly land based. Is that correct? Or yes, were you? You were mostly land based. Yes, we were. So you never landed on a carrier. Yeah, no. They we had a, a, a field carrier. The general progression is when you finish the advanced fighters went up to the Great Lakes where they had a small carrier to get carrier qualified. And they needed night fighters so badly, they thought, that they uh, they skipped out on us. So our experience was, was uh, these field carrier landings. They had a landing signal also at the end and everything. But of course, there was no pitching. Uh, so when they catapult us off carriers, that was our first experience of getting shot off. And the Navy guys in the ward room would, would openly take bets on how many Marines they were going to drop off the bow, <laughs> give us confidence, <laughs> and tell stories about the Marine who didn't have his arm tucked in his rib cage and he didn't, didn't uh, take his feet off the brakes and as he pulled back on the throttle and screeched his tires 60 feet. And <laughs> I don't know whether that was true or not, but they wanted us to know it. Oh, wow. Um, what did you think of uh, when you flew the F7F Wildcat, the, the, the at the end of the war? How, how was that playing? The Tiger Cat. The Tiger Cat. Yes, yeah, Tiger Cat. Well, we didn't get to fly in. They uh, they hadn't come in yet, and that's what we were waiting for them to come in. And then they dropped the bomb, and then they uh, we didn't train it because we weren't going out in it. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, they had new squadrons coming in by that time. There were only uh, there were three active night fighter squadrons in the Marine Corps: one F four U squadron and two F six F squadrons. But interestingly enough, they sent a colonel and two majors to England to observe their night fighter tactics. In the, there was in a bow fighter, it was a twin engine, uh, not very effective program. But these guys came back and uh, recommended mature uh, instrument pilots. So what they got was uh, brand new second lieutenants. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> <laughs> but it, uh, 
I still I think would like I would like to have been in a Corsair squadron, which saw action. Mm -hmm. So, most of your missions, what what was um, what was a typical mission like for you? Well, we were either on night. There were two of us up at a time, one on the northern end, and, one, and we were just vectored around by the ground radar, waiting for some blip to appear on his screen so he could send us after him. And uh, they were called night combat air patrols, and uh, we did that. And then bombing and strafing. Rota was a complete. We kept hoping we'd get something in. One time there was, they got word that the Japanese were going to uh, come colliding in and it was a suicide thing really. The planes would blow up but they'd be out of it and shooting on them. And they lined up uh, our strip with, uh, with uh, tents with explosives. <laughs> so we were landed very carefully but uh, then that never happened. One time they got us out of bed and, those of us that were, weren't flying and uh, told us to grab our car aids and ammunition and we were laying on the side of a hill that was, they thought they were coming down from the hills, and uh, but they didn't. What they used to do, I, every now and then, we had our own landing light crew and we had hooded letting us, you could fly over the field and not see them. You had to approach uh, a certain way so you could see the lights. Hmm. And they'd get them all strung out, and when a plane uh, started to take off, a Japanese guy would sneak down and hack the wires, and the lights would go out. <laughs> That's when Harley Croft <laughs> hit the jeep at the end of the runway. Yeah. <laughs> but we had wrestlers that went twice to uh, uh, Waikiki for a week at a time, wrestlers. We were looking forward to going to Australia for our wrestlers, and they changed our group. We got into a, a different air group, uh, which used Hawaii, but that wasn't bad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what were the living conditions like on on the islands that you stayed on? I mean, climate-wise. Yeah. Well, know. they were really primitive. These uh, uh, Chamorro natives in the Marianas were really brow beaten by the Japanese and they uh, they were really afraid of us when we came in. But they uh, they came and picked up our laundry for a dollar. They would take the laundry and beat it on rocks in the streams and uh, bring it back. And then the army came in and they screwed it up. They paid them four or five dollars for the laundry. <laughs> It was good for the natives, but bad for us. <laughs> but they, uh, they were then friendly. They, we didn't have much contact with them. Mm -hmm. But the, I was sitting with a, uh, with a ground fight, fighting marine, a real marine, up in Saipan, and he said that the. Uh, when they saw a, a Japanese soldier going up that cliff, he'd let him get almost to the top and then he'd shoot him. <laughs> but the women were so frightened with the tales that they were told, they were jumping off, holding babies mm -hmm. and jumping off the cliff rather than get captured by the, the uh, terrible marine, terrible uh, Americans. Mm -hmm. who, raped them and killed them, and mm -hmm. that was the... Uh, you know, in Spirit of Santos, we had an interesting uh, deal. A coast watcher, Australian coast watcher, would take us uh, through the jungle and show us what edible, what plants were edible and what plants weren't, and uh, what fish were, were uh, edible, if you were lucky enough to catch it. And we came out on a, this was at the Spirit of Santos, we came out of a, a clearing, out of the jungle, a clearing, and there were about 10 or 15 women hoeing in a garden, and they saw us coming. They dropped the hose and took off. They were frightened too. Oh, wow. Did they ever learn 
to trust the American Oh soldiers? yeah, I felt sure they were because mm -hmm. they were treated. The guy gave, you know, we used to give candy. I go, I sent a uh, home and asked for them, uh, my folks to get me guitar strings. It was a little kid that was playing uh, If You Were a Tulip, <laughs> I Wore a Big Red Rose. <laughs> but he, a string was broken, so I was able to get him to set, which was a big deal. And, wow. Uh, it was quite a deal. <laughs> <laughs> what did you do in your downtime, like between missions? What did you use to pass? What did you do to pass the time? Well, we get down and we would uh, a bunch of us would drink a bunch of beer <laughs> and then uh, sleep. Try to get sleep in the daytime, and we would sleep at night until it was our time to fly. And then that guy that uh, they come in and wake you up and had to get up and splash water on your face and fly. That's good, very, my best friend in the Marine Corps, they did that, he was drinking a cup of coffee in the ready tent, and they said, Hat, you, you got to fly. Uh, Pete fell off the wing and hurt his back, so he went out and put on, uh, got in the plane and strapped Pete's parachute on in the Bay West, and uh, he quit, the engine quit. And he had to bail out. And uh, he was a parachute officer, but he said he'd rather walk through a burning jungle than ever jump. It. But he had to jump. And the, uh, he said he got out on the wing, but he had forgotten to turn everything off. He climbed back in and turned off the way <laughs> the radar said, and then went. And he never, uh, he didn't know this, whether or not the chute had opened until. Uh, the plane went out and did a wing over and was coming toward him and screaming with the uh, air scoop. And he was pulled, then he pulled on the shroud line, so he, he knew it was open. But then he hit the water before he uh, got out of the chute. You're supposed to buckle it so you, when your feet hit the water, you just slid out and let the chute go by. And he pulled the toggle switches on the Mae West and the oral tubes are open, so it went through. But he did remember, and uh, you're supposed to get off your pants and tie them and throw them over your head to make water wings, and that's how he, he uh, kept floating until they picked him up. So when you bailed out of an airplane, you have to go, you have to turn off all of your instruments? No, or no, you, oh. no, you just go. He just had was so excited about all this. <laughs> okay, I couldn't figure it out. Was, it was a mean? real funny story about <laughs> his doing that, but it was real hairy. I took this guy's swimming test for him. I'd line up in the seas and they said, Croft, I'd go do everything and go back and do with the Jays. And he was from Iowa, Iowa, and he never had learned how to swim. And uh, they, we, we were up dropping flares and uh, looking for him, and uh, the Navy really went out to, to save pilots, and they were out with searchlights and uh, cruising around, and they, they finally uh, were going to secure the flight, the search, and this guy said to himself, the story goes from that, uh, hell, my light's on, I'll make one more swoop, and that's when they picked him up. Wow. He said when the first light came anywhere near him, he lost his voice yelling and <laughs> he couldn't uh, anymore. And I think that's about the highlights. Okay. Um, Unless you have one. I'm trying to think. Um, what, what do you think was probably your most um, harrowing experience that you, that you had as a, as, you know, with your time during the military? Well, we got shot at a lot from Rhoda. Uh, but we were going pretty f fast when we went over there. I wasn't too worried about it. One uh, Japanese grenade had to be banged against something to explode, and uh, 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 some little Japanese snuck down and crawled through the uh, access hatch in the bottom of the fuselage, and he was there waiting to take the plane and the pilot. 
And fortunately, the plane didn't fly that night, so he blew himself up, blew, blew the side of the plane out. Well, shortly after that, we were all kind of apprehensive. After that, I was up and I heard this banging, and boy, I was crouched <laughs> behind my rubber plated seat. <laughs> but it was a hydraulic knock. <laughs> and I think. Uh, so you're saying what they would do is you'd be taxing, you'd be in your plane ready to take off, and they'd sneak up while your plane's running? No, well, oh. sometime when somebody wasn't watching, wasn't not doing their duty, he'd just uh -huh. come into the line, pick okay. out a plane and go into it. That happened only once, however. I did have uh, probably my most, well, you were always half frightened, uh, but uh, most frightened I was, I think, was uh, was up New Year's Eve, and I hadn't even thought about that up New Year's Eve, and a lot of the fleet was in Guam at the time, and so I was coming back, and suddenly the fleet, everybody was firing, when anything that fires up in the air looks like it's coming right at you, and I thought, God, they don't know that I'm a friendly, I'm a friendly little guy, <laughs> and they're but it was New Year's Eve. It was midnight, so they were celebrating. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> wow. Um, did you keep in touch with your family at all? I uh, have. I did keep in touch with two, three pilots quite regularly, but the, uh, the guy that jumped died pretty early. And the last guy I went through, uh, all through flight training, from Andalusia, Alabama, he died. And Hubbard died. Mm -hmm. So I didn't really don't have any mm -hmm. military contacts. My old CO lives in uh, Hawaii, and I've talked to him a few times by the phone. And uh, I've got a bunch of pictures at the my grandsons are really interested. My grandsons, oddly enough, are more interested than my own kids in this. Really? Yeah. That's amazing. It well, is. There's a big resurgence of interest in World War yeah. II these days. You know? Well, they build the uh, models of all the planes that I flew. And uh, uh, was it Russ? They were in school. The teacher yeah. said something about yeah. World War II yeah. and, uh, or some campaign. That was wrong. And Russ corrected her. Rob? No, it was Russ. Russ. Russ <laughs> corrected her. She was. He knew this story. They were very interested in any kind of story. Well, they still are. Yeah, they'll probably be interested in, in this. Yeah, I'm video. sure you will. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, is there anything you'd like to add in closing or anything? Any any um, any thoughts? You know, I mean, I guess one thing I like one final thing I like to ask you is, looking back on the time you spent yeah. in the military. Did it impact your life after oh, that? Oh yeah, uh, I would not have met Mary. Mm -hmm. uh, I would have stayed in the regular Marine Corps. My CO at the uh, at Cherry Point, Pete Lambert, uh, was a c colonel. He got killed in Korea, and uh, it, I would have had an entirely different life because mm -hmm. I would have if I had. Uh, stayed alive in the reserve, I, in the regular Marine Corps, I'd be long retired by now, and uh, but I'm glad it worked out the way it did. Mm -hmm. But it was a good thing. Most of us went in from jobs which weren't paying all that well, and suddenly we were had a, when we were in the States, nice uh, officers clubs, good food, mm -hmm. really enjoying life like mad, and or doing that thing that we wanted to do too, fly. Always wanted to fly, so I got to do that, and I flew the hottest planes the Navy had, married the prettiest nurse, <laughs> so <laughs> it all worked out for the best. <laughs> um, did you get to fly at all after you got out of the military? No, I... I uh, was going to stay in, in the reserve and fly, but we lived and we built a house up in the woods in northern New Jersey, and the closest base was uh, 
Willow Grove, Pennsylvania, which was quite a hike out. But And you went once a month, and you flew with uh, guys who hadn't flown any more than I had. And you're flying in formation with a bunch of guys that uh, it's the first time they've flown in a month. And I thought we were having kids, and I thought, I don't think I want to do that. Yeah. <laughs> Well, we, I did have a, we were getting a car loan and the uh, young banker was in, there, had a, was in the Marine Corps and he had a, a, a rifle outfit within oh, 20 miles of Chatham. And uh, he said, well, you ought to come up and join um, our group. I'll make you a recreation officer or something. I told him, well, I, I'm a flying marine, I'm not a ground marine. <laughs> And he said, I'll make you the recreation officer. Well, we d talked about it, but, but didn't do it. <laughs> and uh, then uh, they were activated, and they went out to the West Coast and went out, broke up, and went out as replacements. So I would have been uh, uh, a captain with a bunch of guys. I would have either been killed or my own men would have killed me because I wouldn't know what I was doing. <laughs> So it's a good thing I didn't do that. But. You ever wish you could fly a Hellcat again? Yeah, I do every every now and then. I, uh, but I told Barry this morning I don't think I could climb up in one with my back. And <laughs> if I got in it, I couldn't see. Have you ever been able to, um, you know, get back in the cockpit of a hot Hellcat again, or just you know, I mean, have you had have you ever had a chance to do that again? Oh, when we went down, to Pensacola has a beautiful naval uh, flight museum. Every plane, excepting the Brewster Buffalo, the F-2A, which I flew, uh, the little stubby, it was fashioned after the you know, GB Racer, which was a round barrel with little wings. And uh, that's the only plane that I, uh, that I flew that they didn't have. So that was really great. We had the grand, we had the family down there for, mm -hmm. on the, the beach, Santa Rosa Beach at Pensacola. We spent a day over there. It was great. Mm -hmm. But uh, and they have all the planes and the you could climb and look in the cockpits and the, it was a great experience. And I did. Uh, I first I used to dream about flying, but I don't do that anymore. Hmm. Well, is there anything in closing that you'd like to add? Anything that we haven't covered? No, I think it was a, a great experience today. It's so different. Everything is a night fighter now because they're flying a computer, not an airplane, mm -hmm. I think. But it's all, uh, we had uh, a squadron uh, at a Marine Corps reunion of um, young guys. We had, they were going to do a flyover at Scottsdale, but then the city would let them do it. And we invited them as a major, and uh, I guess for young captains, to come and have that to our dinner dance the closing night. And Joe Foss, Marine Ace, was uh, the speaker. And he said he didn't mind coming head to head with the Zero because he had uh, 650s and they had a couple of 20, uh, 20 millimeter. So I said to this one kid, I don't suppose you can equate coming head to head. And he said, no, sir, if uh, we're coming in head to head, if one of us doesn't veer off and while well, we're 30 miles apart, we'll have a mid-air collision. So that's how fast they go. My it. Lord. <laughs> yeah. I watch uh, dog fights on, uh, they had a great uh, success uh, sequence. I think I saw that one. That was very good on the Hellcat. Yeah. 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 But no, I think uh, I would, uh, I don't know whether I recommend it as a career for anyone now or not. You have to be really. Uh, tuned in to, well, all kids are tuned in to computers and they understand a lot more than the, I have a computer and it's got the magnaview, so, you know, I've got to increase the size of the text 
about that big to read it, and it, I'm losing interest in it. But <laughs> I let it read it to me, and then I print it and give it to Mary. But uh, Marine Corps is tough to recommend to any kid today. They're killing them off so fast. This computer stuff, this has nothing to do with, with the interview, but I just got new hearing aids, this PhD, and who I had not been to before, audiologist, and he had to make he made ear molds, which uh, the hearing aid is this thing behind your ear, mm -hmm. and the mold goes down, that's the speaker for your, for your canal, and he uh, has a computer program that gives him a three-dimensional view of this mold. He sends it uh, down to the lab by computer. The mold never leaves his office. And they send it back as a perfect fit. For the wow. Technology is amazing, isn't it? Yeah, the technology <laughs> is wild. Well, you know, I mean, I, I think that, you know, looking back at World War II, um, yeah, I think that's probably one of the three most significant events in the U.S. history, you know, the Revolutionary War, Civil War, mm -hmm. and World War II, and seeing the impact that World War II had on the 20th century and our, you know, what the freedoms or the, the things we enjoy today, all the amenities we enjoy is, mm. you know, I mean, those four years, I mean, I think it's amazing what, what you guys did in, in those four years. We went from being a third or fourth rate military, really, at the beginning of the war, to in four years being the preeminent superpower. Yeah. And I think that's a pretty significant accomplishment, and we have been since then. I mean, all throughout, I mean, to this day, we've kept our edge, and I think, you know, the stuff that you guys did, um, you know, yeah, it was really we're amazing. all very grateful for it. So. When you look back at what... Uh what air has has become when I when I was at Pensacola, the uh, the torpedo bomber that they were training with was canvas covered. It was uh, I mean they hadn't really developed aircraft then. Mm -hmm. uh, and the old the DC three was a fantastic <laughs> transport plane. <laughs> and that's not that's uh, they're still flying some I think, but they mm -hmm. uh, it a lot. Uh, I had a friend who was an advertising manager for Esquire magazine. I was home on leave one time, and he invited me down to uh, his office to have lunch. And uh, I did go, and he was—he had just made a film to send to advertisers on what has been developed by the war. For, and for example, uh, uh, antiprespirants. Yeah, Croft and I were going to Honolulu on this, uh, to Waikiki on the rest leave, and they, a couple of army nurses uh, asked us if they would, we would get some uh, mum, which was one of the early mm -hmm. cream deodorants and, and for them. And it was like they'd asked us to get sanitary napkins or something. We flipped a coin to say to see who was going into the drugstore and buy the damn mom. And John said uh, it was amazing how few people, especially from the southern states, never had a toothbrush before they went into service. Yeah. And uh, Andy Presbrins and shave lotion stuff was, uh, uh, in this film he did, was developed with the closeness of uh, like in a submarine, mm -hmm. uh, and the lack of, uh, I think one of the big shocks was the lack of privacy when you first went and you had no privacy at all. Well, you didn't have privacy if it, uh, the way to be in the service is to be commissioned. Because <laughs> mm -hmm. then you used to have a little bit of privacy. <laughs> yeah, but we uh, we made a lot of good influential friends in the we had met uh, who was the junior congressman from Texas. Texas. What was his name? He got shot in the car with uh, uh, what's his Connolly. Name? Oh wow! Really? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, well, Navy nurses were quite a 
women in the service were quite a, uh, a novelty at first. They, mm -hmm. I remember when they walked, escorted the first women marine uh, through our base. We, we didn't even know that there were women in the Marine Corps. And it but opened the eyes of a lot of guys. I, when I was at the University of <coughs> Georgia, it was the first time I had seen uh, white only drinking fountains. And oh, really? I was going to walk in the back of a train one time, and the conductor said, "This is as far as you go. That's black back there." Wow! And the, the discrimination was. Uh, was really going. I, I guess it still is in some still places, is but in some places. Mm -hmm. that was well. When I first started the old business, the uh, the black folks were going to boycott Shell because Shell still had white and black restrooms, hmm. and that wasn't so long ago. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Although it was, when you get to be a little bit past the mid '80s, you look back at it. So you said, hell, I can't be that old. Yeah. <laughs> and then you look and see how quickly this year was going by. Mm -hmm. and you, you get a better feel for it. But mm -hmm. it, uh, I don't know where, uh, if I had, if there had not been a war and I had not been in the service and uh, did the things that I did and loved, uh, I don't, have no idea what life would have been like. Mm -hmm. I probably would have uh, completed the uh, school and was heavily involved in, in, uh, in bank courses and probably worked at a bank and commuted in every day and uh, having been in the service got you out of that mode. Mm -hmm. <laughs> wow. Well, um, I have no further questions. For, for Charles, so um, okay. if you'd like, we can go ahead and stop the interview, and then we'll go ahead and try and we'll interview Mary here. So, thanks for your time. I appreciate it. I'll change places.